Hey everyone, welcome back to another terrarium build. You've seen me make all kinds of terrariums on this channel so far, including succulent terrariums, closed terrariums, cactus terrariums, and even tiny terrariums to name a few. With that said, a lot of you guys have been asking me to make a larger terrarium. And this is something that I've wanted to do even before the suggestions started piling in. I just had to shop around and find a container at a good price. So, I managed to find this 7 gallon jar for $15 at a flea market. Compared to what you guys have seen thus far, this is a really large container. Do I intend to go larger than this someday? Absolutely, but this is what we're going to be working with today. Let's start by doing a size comparison of this container compared to some of the terrariums you've seen me build in the past. Here's the closed terrarium from How To Terrarium Episode 2, and here's one of the larger tiny terrariums. To begin, I had to get a suitable lid. I wanted to restore the metal lid that this jar came with, but it really wasn't salvageable. It's all rusted out and overall just not in good shape. I could have made my own lid, but I didn't feel like dealing with it at the time. So I made some measurements and ordered a cork for $6 that was the proper size. When looking for containers, especially at thrift stores or flea markets, you will likely have to do some kind of restoration. That said, obviously this container needed a new lid, but it also needed a good cleaning. To do so, I vacuumed out all of the larger debris and then applied some rubbing alcohol to a paper towel and thoroughly scrubbed the inside of this jar. I don't know what was in this container previously, but it wasn't very clean. Luckily, there were no scratches, so afterward the jar looked brand new. I shop around for pretty much everything and for $21 total, this was truly a steal. Now we can turn this jar into a terrarium. I like to start by making a false bottom. I've explained the purpose of a false bottom many times before, but in case you're new to all of this, it helps create a proper water cycle within the jar, among other things. Follow the link to learn more about this. With that out of the way, I simply cut a piece of carbon fiberglass window screen using an X-Acto knife. You could use scissors, but something like a utility knife is much more efficient. Also, it's best to cut the mesh slightly larger than the diameter of the container itself. I'll explain why shortly. Now that the mesh is cut, I grab the component for my drainage layer. Here I have some Lika, which are basically hydroponic clay pellets. You could use various materials for this layer, but in this case I chose Lika as to keep the container a little lighter. I could have used gravel or the egg crate false bottom, but I wanted to keep it simple. After rinsing the Lika to remove any debris, they could be used in the terrarium. Normally I add about an inch of the drainage element give or take, but in this case I added about 2 inches of Lika since the container is so large. In retrospect this might have been a bit overkill, but at this point it can't be helped. Now we can add the mesh. In a best case scenario, you want your mesh to curl upward like so. This is why it's good to cut the mesh larger than the container itself. The reason being that when we add the substrate or soil into the jar, it will prevent it from going down into the false bottom. Inevitably, some substrate will likely go into the false bottom, but let's do what we can to minimize it. Next we'll add a layer of lump wood charcoal. This will act as a purification element that will aid in cleaning the water as it passes through the substrate during the water cycle. For more information on this, follow the link. A fine layer that covers most of the false bottom will work fine. Alternatively, you could use activated carbon, horticultural charcoal, or even rinsed bonfire coals, but lump wood charcoal is what I prefer to use. Now it's time to add the substrate. Here's the same mix that I typically use for closed terrariums, which is more or less an ABG mix. To learn how to make it for yourself, follow the link. You can use other substrates of course, but this is what I use in my vivariums and I've found that it produces excellent results in terrariums as well. When adding the substrate, I like to add a thin base layer and then add more throughout the build as needed. In this case I started out by adding roughly an inch of substrate. With some of the substrate added, it was time to move on to the plants. Here I have a Syngonium podophyllum and a Pilea sprucana. I chose these plants because they are somewhat large and contrast nicely with one another. There's some nice green yellow hues in the Syngonium and the Pilea has some nice texture as well as reddish hues. These will complement one another and aid in creating a natural looking terrarium. I will likely have to trim both plants from time to time to ensure that this terrarium always looks its best. Since these plants are large to begin with, I'm going to remove most of their soil and section them off into multiple plants. Using these plants, I wanted to create a lush background area. 
When complete, this background area will face the window. I began by adding a manageable section of the syngonium and more substrate as needed. With a little work, I got it nicely placed and added a few segments of the pilea and more substrate. With the background plants in place, I can now add the hardscape elements. Generally when I build terrariums, I start with the most prominent elements and work my way down to the fine details. In some cases that's the plants, in others it's the hardscape. Anyways, I moved these rocks around until the placement was just right. This might seem easy, but I find that placing elements like this takes more time than anything else. That said, be patient when placing your hardscape elements, because they will either make or break your design. After getting these rocks situated, I let the terrarium sit for a week because I went on vacation. In doing so, you could probably see that the plants perked up quite nicely. With fresh eyes, I was also able to determine that I liked the current design. Anyways, I got two more plants which are Peperomia frizzeri and Ficus puma quercifolia, otherwise known as oak leaf creeping fig. Both of these have smaller leaves and therefore will create additional textural contrast. I'm placing the Peperomia on spots near the background plants because they grow somewhat tall by comparison. They will also fill in some of the holes in the background and create somewhat of a mid-ground. If you've been with the channel even for a bit, you know that I always like to incorporate some type of moss. I'm using some java moss here, which is actually an aquatic moss, but it works very well in terrariums and vivariums because of the humidity. That said, I'm adding more moss than I typically would, as I want it to grow in as fast as possible, and I have more than I need at the current time. I pulled the moss into small, manageable sections and placed them all throughout the bottom of the terrarium. After getting some of the moss in place, I decided to add a few pieces of bark to the foreground. Then I added the rest of the java moss. Now it was finally time to add the oak leaf creeping fig. I cut them up into several cuttings and placed them in areas that I felt would create nice ground coverage as it grows. Then I misted the terrarium to add water, keep the moss from drying out, and to clean some of the glass. To complete the planting portion of this build, I grabbed a few Slaginella uncinata cuttings from one of my vivariums and placed them throughout the foreground. The combination of oak leaf creeping fig, moss, and Slaginella will create a dense carpet of foliage that will look quite natural. As you probably expected by now, I'm going to add some springtails. As I've explained in the past, these will clear any potential mold outbreaks and will also aid in breaking down organic material, which in turn will fertilize the plants. This in turn will help create an overall healthier environment. For more information on springtails, follow the link. I did a final cleanup of the glass using a clean paper towel and corked the jar. Here's the final design. You might be thinking that with all of that space, I should have added more plants and or more prominent animals. I didn't do any of that because my goal with this terrarium was to create a minimalistic design that showcases the plants. Additionally, it will fill in as the plants grow and eventually become very dense. There's no point in adding a ton of plants to begin with because they are going to grow and fill the container eventually. I also think watching your terrarium fill in is part of the fun. 
As I explained earlier, I will have to trim and maintain this terrarium from time to time because of the plants that I chose. This is something that I typically do anyways, but I figured I would let you know that I do in fact maintain most of my terrariums. However, I usually open my terrariums only for the sake of controlling the growth of my plants. Finally, I place this terrarium on a north facing windowsill with a few of my other terrariums. For now, it hangs slightly off of the edge, but this is something that I will address at a different time. That about does it for this build. If you want to learn more specifics on the things you saw me do in this video, check out the video description for links, visit my channel, or drop a question. As always, I hope you enjoyed this brief demonstration, and thank you for watching.